This afternoon, our opening keynote speaker is the Honorable John Holbrook. He is an outstanding leader in the United States who has already had global impact. I've known Dr. Holbrook for a long time myself. I have admired his individual contributions and his important contributions to science policy in the United States. He served as the senior advisor to President Barack Obama, and he led the Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. He was the office director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and he co-chaired the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. He was previously the Teresa and John Hines Professor of Environmental Policy at the Kennedy, Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, and uh, he has, following his experience with the President and science policy nationally, resumed that role uh, at Harvard University. I'm really grateful that he made the commitment to be with us this afternoon, and I invite him forward for his presentation. The Energy Climate Change Challenge and Sustainable Well-Being, Status, Prospects, and Opportunities. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Holtrum. Well, thank you very much, Mark. It's a great uh, privilege and honor for me to be here. I'm grateful to Washington University, to Tsinghua University, to the McDonnell Academy uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity to speak to a fabulously uh, qualified and distinguished audience. I'm going to cover quite a lot of ground in these remarks. It's possible that some of the slides will go by a little quickly, uh, but I assure that the presentation will be posted, so uh, you'll have an opportunity, if you wish, to review the slides. I'm going to cover uh, quite a lot of territory. As I mentioned, this is an outline uh, of the topics that I will be uh, addressing this afternoon, and uh, let's launch uh, right into it. Uh, I start with the proposition that human well-being sits on a stool with three legs. Uh, one leg is economic and technological conditions and processes, as elaborated here. A second leg is socio-political conditions and processes. And the third leg is environmental conditions and processes, which, as we'll see in some detail, uh, very much include the Earth's climate. If we think about the meaning of sustainability and the meaning of development, I suggest that development should mean improving human well-being in all three of these dimensions, not only the economic one, but also the socio-political and environmental ones. I submit that sustainable development should mean doing so by means and to endpoints that are consistent with maintaining the improved conditions indefinitely. And I suggest thirdly that the sustainability challenge is to create the understandings, institutions, and mechanisms that we will need to achieve development that is comprehensive in the sense of point one and sustainable in the sense of point two. This is not just a matter of sustainably improving human well-being where and how it is now deficient. It's also a matter of converting to a sustainable basis the maintenance and further improvement of human well-being where and how it is now adequate but unsustainable. Climate is the envelope within which all environmental conditions and processes operate. Climate governs and therefore altering climate affects the height of the sea, the geography of disease, the availability of fresh water, the formation and dispersion of air pollutants, the productivity of farms and forests and fisheries, the prevalence of oppressive heat and humidity, the damages that we must expect from storms, floods, droughts, and wildfires, and the distribution and abundance of species, those that we need, those that we love, and those that we hate. To wreck the climate is to wreck the environmental basis of sustainable well-being. So let me turn to the character of the energy climate challenge 
in a bit of detail. The essence of the challenge is that without energy, there is no economy. Without climate, there is no environment. And without economy and environment, there is no material well-being, there is no civil society, there is no personal or national security. And the essence of the challenge is that the world has long been getting most of the energy its economies need in ways that are now seriously disrupting the climate that its environment needs. By the early 21st century, the growth of population and affluence had increased the 1850 rate of energy use by more than 20-fold. And as you see in this diagram, most of this growth over the period of more than 150 years came from coal, oil, and natural gas, or fossil fuels. Civilization's emissions of carbon dioxide grew in step with fossil fuel use and deforestation. And that is because coal, oil, and natural gas, as well as wood, are carbon-based fuels, and in each case, burning them makes CO2 and water vapor, virtually all of it, ending up in the atmosphere. The water vapor stays there only briefly, so the additions do not accumulate, but much of the carbon dioxide stays there for centuries and millennia, and therefore the carbon dioxide accumulates in the atmosphere and the concentrations change. Here's where we were in 2017. In the world, for China, for the United States and India, China, the United States, and India are the three largest emitters of carbon dioxide from fossil fuel use. And you see, to the surprise of many, the extraordinary continuing dependence of the world on fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas for energy. 82% of the world's primary energy in 2017 came from the fossil fuels. China and the United States, the percentage was even higher. And you see that in purchasing power parity corrected terms, China is already the largest economy in the world, as well as the largest emitter of carbon dioxide. Nearly 40% of world primary energy use went to electricity generation, and of that, even with the contributions of hydropower, wind, solar, geothermal, and nuclear energy, two-thirds of the electricity generation still came from fossil fuels. And of course, with those rising emissions came rising concentrations. Here you see the rather stunning result, the main panel, 10,000 years of carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere, and what you see is a gradual rise over the course of the industrial, of the agricultural revolution, and then this incredibly sharp turn at the onset of the industrial revolution when we started to burn fossil fuels. On the left-hand side is the carbon dioxide concentration. On the right-hand side is what climate scientists call forcing, how hard that increased concentration of carbon dioxide is pushing on the climate of the Earth by altering the energy balance. We also added non-carbon dioxide greenhouse gases, and they contributed as well to the growth of human forcing on the climate over this period. Methane, nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons, hydrofluorocarbons. Uh, the forcing from the non-CO2 human-caused greenhouse gases adds up altogether to about 60% of the forcing from carbon dioxide. So they are important additions which accelerate the change of the Earth's climate. And we see when we look at the temperature record from 1880 up through 2017, the period of decent thermometer measurements of the average surface temperature of the Earth, the global and annually average surface air temperature, that human influences now dominate natural ones on the trajectory of the temperature of the Earth. It's bouncy because of natural variability, but the upward trend is unmistakable. The four hottest years in this whole period were 2014, 2015, 2016, and 2017. The Greenland ice sheet 
Not surprisingly, given the increase in temperature and the fact that the Arctic is warming even faster than the rest of the world, is rapidly losing ice. That's contributing to sea level rise. If the entire Greenland sheet disintegrated, global sea level would rise 23 feet, would rise seven meters. The Antarctic ice sheet, we now know, is also shrinking. That was only learned relatively recently. And loss of the most vulnerable part of that ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, that alone would raise sea level by another five meters or 16 feet. Sea level rise, not surprisingly, is accelerating. You see here that the first third of the uh, 20th century, uh, sea level rise was only half as fast as it was in the period 1930 to 1992. The rate of sea level rise doubled again for the period following 1993. And if you look just at the period since 2010, it has nearly doubled again. Climate change, and this is very important, is already causing growing harm. This is not just a problem for our children and grandchildren. It is a problem right now for everyone now alive. Around the world, we are seeing in various combinations increases in floods, drought, wildfires, heat waves, the power of the strongest storms, a variety of other forms of harm to human health, impacts of crop and forest pests, coastal erosion and inundation from sea level rise, permafrost thawing and subsidence, and the impact of <clears throat> ocean acidification, warming, altered currents, loss of sea ice on the distribution and abundance of valued species. All of these phenomena are plausibly linked to climate change by theory, by models, and by observed fingerprints, meaning the patterns in space and time with which these phenomena are increasing. Most of them are growing more rapidly than until recently was projected. These are all time temperature records for these different places that have been set just in the last two years, 27 and, uh, 2017, 2018. Just astonishing, and this is a result of the fact that small changes in mean temperatures lead to big changes in extreme highs. We've seen an extraordinary strengthening of the most powerful hurricanes and typhoons in almost every ocean basin that experiences these tropical cyclones, we see that the strongest storms on record have occurred since 2012. Thank you very much. Taking a quick look at future climate change and its impacts, we know that temperatures will continue to rise, but how much they rise depends strongly on emissions. On the left, scenarios from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, from business as usual, that's the red one on top, to uh, drastic declines in emissions as a result of policies to reduce them. Uh, and on the right, you see the big differences in projected global temperatures associated with those different scenarios. But as you see, the temperature goes up even under the lowest emission scenarios. We cannot stop temperature rise overnight. Absent big emissions reductions, we can expect all of these phenomena that we have been experiencing to get worse. Record heat waves become the new normal. We see more torrential downpours and more flooding. Big expansion in the areas burned by wildfires. Destruction of most of the world's coral reefs. Wider disruption of marine food webs and fisheries. Big increases in the intensity and frequency of droughts. Many more category three to five hurricanes and typhoons making landfall. We just had a category four hit the Gulf Coast of the United States. More sickness and death from heat stress, tropical diseases, falling agricultural yields from maize, wheat, rice, soybeans. Sea level rise could well reach one meter by 2050 and two meters by 2100. And as a result, we will see much bigger flows of environmental refugees. What can we do? We have only three options. Mitigation, the measures we take to reduce the pace and the ultimate magnitude of the changes in global climate that we are causing. Adaptation, the measures we take to reduce the adverse impacts on human well-being that result from the changes in climate that nonetheless do occur. And the third option is suffering. Suffering the adverse impacts and the disruption of society that are not avoided by either mitigation or adaptation. 
number of possibilities. Our list of here, certainly, we can and will reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and black soot from the energy sector. We'll reduce deforestation, increase reforestation and afforestation. We'll modify agricultural practices to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and build up soil carbon. We might remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere technologically if we get desperate enough. And we might, if we get desperate enough, undertake so-called geoengineering, solar radiation management to create cooling effects offsetting part of greenhouse warming. We do not yet know whether either one of these will actually be practical and worth undertaking. Lots of adaptation possibilities as well. A bunch of them are listed here. I won't read them to you in the interest of time, but you can read faster than I can talk in any case. The key point is that many of the measures that one would take to increase resilience, to be more prepared for the climate changes that are coming, are measures that would be helpful even in a stable climate. After all, we've always had heat waves, we've always had droughts, we've always had wildfires, we've always had powerful storms, and we've always been underprepared. The fact that climate change is increasing the frequency and intensity of these forms of harm only adds to the reasons to invest in adaptation. Concerning mitigation, adaptation, and suffering, the three options, it's important to understand that we're already doing some of each. We're mitigating, we're adapting, and we're suffering. What's at stake today in the choices we make is the future mix of adaptation, mitigation, and suffering. And if we want to minimize the amount of suffering in that mix, as should be our goal, we can only do that by doing a lot of mitigation and a lot of adaptation. These two are not substitutes, they are complements. Mitigation alone won't work because climate change is already occurring and it can't be stopped quickly. Adaptation alone won't work because adaptation gets costlier and less effective as the climate change to which one is trying to adapt gets worse. And so we need enough mitigation to avoid unmanageable climate change and enough adaptation to manage unavoidable climate change. How much mitigation does that mean? How soon? First of all, we are far from on track even to meet the two degree C goal of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the goal that was embraced unanimously at the Paris Conference, embraced also in Copenhagen in 2009, not because it's safe, but because it is the lowest increase above pre-industrial that experts thought at the time was plausibly achievable. This graph takes a lot of study, but the key message is the Paris agreements, even with continued ambition, are far from providing assurance that we will be below uh, two degrees. Uh, the Paris commitments have to be regarded as only a first step. What is worse, most countries are not on track to meet their Paris commitments, and even increased ambition which the Paris Agreement calls for, even increased ambition, gives only about a 30% chance of staying below two degrees C increase over the pre-industrial level. So meeting the two degrees goal looks very difficult, yet that would be far from safe. The community of nations agreed to it, as I mentioned, not because it was safe. The array of adverse impacts already being experienced at the current increase of about one degree Celsius above pre-industrial has led the hardest hit countries to argue in Paris in 2015 that two degrees would be devastating and the world should aim for a lower increase. They should aim for 1.5. As a result, the Conference of the Parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change asked the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change whether 1.5 degrees might be attainable and what benefits holding the increase to that level rather than two degrees might bring. That report was just released at the beginning of this week in Korea, and it is a wake-up call for the complacent. It paints a frightening picture of the devastating impacts to be expected if the global average temperature goes as high as two degrees C above the pre-industrial level. It calls into serious question 
whether sustainable prosperity can be achieved at all in a world two degrees C warmer than the pre-industrial world. It notes that even 1.5 degrees will entail much bigger damages than today's one degree, but still much less than two degrees, and therefore offers a better chance for sustainable prosperity. And it points out that all countries and all sectors would need to undertake deep cuts starting essentially immediately if staying below 1.5 degrees is to be possible. This is an illustration directly from that report released um, less than a week ago of what the emissions pathways have to look like, both to get to 1.5 without first overshooting and in the, uh, in the lighter gray, showing how you could get there if you allowed the temperature first to go to two degrees and then come back down by the end of the century. So let me turn to the role of research universities. Many global challenges command the attention of our research universities. I've listed a bunch of them here, and even this is not the total. These are just examples of the global challenges that our research universities need to be addressing. I've been focusing here on climate change as a complex existential threat to sustainable well-being, but some of the others on that list I just showed have that characteristic too. They're existential threats to sustainable well-being. Nuclear war, for example, is an existential threat. All of those challenges are potentially disruptive enough that they deserve the attention of the world's great research universities. Addressing most of them requires, or at least would benefit significantly, from fundamental advances in the natural sciences, social sciences, and technology. And the achievement of such advantages is the forte of our research universities. Most of them are highly interdisciplinary in character, meaning they can only be understood and effectively addressed by integrating insights and approaches from a wide variety of disciplines. Research universities have lately been getting better at doing this. And moving toward solutions for most of these challenges is impeded today by lack of public and policymaker understanding, which research universities are in a position to address both in the short term and the long term. So let me look specifically about what research universities need to do. In research, they need to continue to recruit and support the people, provide the facilities, and sustain the policies that have made research universities the mainstay of basic and early stage applied research. They need to make room for interdisciplinary and policy relevant research as additions to the university's portfolio. They need to provide PhD, PhD students and postdocs with an introduction to translating discovery into application. And they need to partner with business where appropriate to leverage resources and exploit science and technology advances for societal gain. In outreach, they need to encourage and support faculty forays into positions in government via sabbaticals, interagency partnership agreements, fellowships, and they need to exploit the experiences of the returnees in classes, seminars, and symposia to interest others in outreach. They need to create workshops and seminars for public officials to acquaint them with the relevance of university research to society's needs. They need to conduct adult education and public outreach activities aimed at improving science and technology literacy of decision makers and the public as a basis for more informed engagement with societal challenges. And finally, in teaching for the longest term returns, they need to strengthen undergraduate curricula and requirements in natural and social sciences and technology. They need to infuse lower division teaching in these domains by linking that teaching to real world challenges. They need to strengthen the preparation of K through 12 teachers via partnerships of education schools with disciplinary departments. And they need to engage in public, private, academic, philanthropic partnerships to inspire, engage, recruit, and support more kids, more young people in natural and social sciences and technology journeys.
germane to global challenges, including girls and minorities historically underrepresented in these fields. Thank you. John, that was a, a tremendous overview of many challenges that we face. I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to hear you, and I know that others would join me in that, in that statement. In a way, I'm just delighted that you were our opening speaker, because you've affirmed our thoughts about what our partnership of the McDonald Academy Partners can actually do and we can work globally. Thank you for being with us for this opening of our McDonald International Scholars Academy Symposium, co-hosted by Tsinghua University. I know you've had a tremendous relationship with Tsinghua. You hold a very distinguished position with that university, and we're grateful that you're a part of this important meeting here in Beijing. I have a small gift I would like to give to you as a memento and reminder of this occasion. This is a small gift that we've crafted. It's, it's a telescope and uh, it has an engraving of a quote from John McDonald, our founding benefactor, and it says, quote, this telescope, see far and clearly, think globally, act boldly. Your inspiring opening address encourages us in many, many ways. Thank you very much. Thank you.